Let's go to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And I want us to, I want us to think about some things this morning. I want you to kind of uh, maybe take a personal uh, spiritual inventory is what I'm going to want you to do. But let's go ahead and read Luke 16 before I get into what I'm going to be preaching about this morning. In verse 1, it says, And he said unto, also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do for my Lord? Taketh away from me the stewardship, but I, I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed, and I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. And he said to another, How much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. And the Lord commanded the, unjust, commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Here in this passage, we have a parable of a steward. And... Um, Tonight, actually, uh, my message I'm going to be preaching, I'm going to be preaching tonight about the prodigal son, uh, which is very, uh, or the, the parable of two sons, which is a very uh, well-known passage of Scripture. And this parable that we're reading right here, it actually kind of goes along with that parable. And I'm telling you, what, what I preach this parable to you tonight, it's going to be like you've never heard it before. But it is going to be the accurate interpretation of, of that parable. And this one goes along with it. And I'm not going to get into that this morning, but there are some, just some practical things that we see in here, some principles that we learn while this, what I'm talking about this morning is not the primary interpretation of this parable, but we do see here, it's a parable of a steward. Okay. Someone who is entrusted with some things. All right. This, uh, his Lord, his, uh, he had given him some things. He had given him stewardship over his possessions over his good. That's what a steward is. A steward is someone who takes care of something that belongs to someone else. And they have responsibilities, you know, and as a steward, all right, and all of us in here today, I'm going to show you where all of us in here are stewards to one extent or another. Spiritually, we're all stewards. But when you're a steward, you know, you're managing something that belongs to someone else. Okay. This man, he had been entrusted with some goods, maybe money, all right? A bank, you could say, a bank is a steward of your money, all right? How would you all feel if you went to the bank tomorrow and went to withdraw some money and were like, oh, it's not there anymore. We lost it, all right? You're going to throw a fit, aren't you? Because that was your money that was in the bank and you allowed them to take care of it, you know, and they do certain things with it. You know, they give loans. They, you know, there are certain services that they provide but in the end, you know, you are allowing them to handle your money and you have expectations. You expect there to at least be as much there, you know, as there, you know, if you put it in, you expect it to be there to take out. And that, that's just an expectation that we have. They are stewards of our money. And, you know, you expect them to put it in a safe and, and to keep it safe and to keep it from thieves. And, you know, and a steward at any time, a steward ought to be able to tell his master exactly what he has done with his possessions. I mean, how would you like it if you went to the bank and they're like, uh, you know, like I want to withdraw all my money. And they're like, well, how much do you have in there? Because we don't know. We don't really keep good records. I would actually like it if my bank did that because I might be able to get away with something right then. But, you know, they're, they're supposed to be able to tell you exactly what happened. They keep, they keep records and, and you expect those things to be accurate. It's called, it's called giving an account. Okay. And listen, one of these days we're all going to stand before God and we're going to give an account 
of the things that have been done in our body. In Matthew 12, verse 35, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. I don't know about you, but that verse scares me a little bit. That I'm going to give an account of the things that I do, the words that I say. I'm going to give an account. That's not going to be fun when I'm standing before God and I'm giving account for those idle words. We don't like when our words are thrown in our face. You know, no, no husband likes it when your wife comes and she's like got a transcript in her head of every word that you said to her five years ago. You know, we never can win those arguments, can we? All right. You know, they, they always remember those details, you know, and, and we can't argue with that because we don't. But listen, you know, God's he's going to get it right. And sometimes I think they add a few words in there. You know, I can't combat it because I don't have a transcript. I don't have as good of a memory. But at the same time, uh, when we stand before God, it's going to be accurate and we are going to give an account. And as a steward, we are supposed to use the master's possessions for the master's benefit. Okay. Ultimately, we're trying, you know, we are supposed to benefit them. Hopefully we can benefit too. Listen, I don't know what all the bank does with my money I put in there. I know they loan money out. I know they probably invest in certain things. And you know what? If the bank makes a bunch of money off my money, first of all, I'd like to know how they do that because there's this not, not that much in there. But at the same time, if they make a lot of money off my money, great. All right, but I do have certain expectations myself, of but and, and I expect to benefit somehow. All right, if you invest money in stocks or mutual funds or a four hundred one k, all right, that's your money you're putting in there, and there's a company out there that's investing at places we don't always know what they're doing with it, but we ultimately we want to be the ones that benefit. And I remember when I did taxes, I did taxes of a stock broker. And it was the year of the big uh, stock market collapse. And it, when people lost a ton of money, and I was, I mean, I was just absolutely indignant when I saw how much money the guy made that year. That year when investors lost, I mean, large amounts of money, this guy cleaned a house. Maybe he was just good. I personally think he was a crook. I don't, I don't know. But uh, it, it, was, it, it was upsetting because I thought all these people that allowed you to be a steward of their money. You lost it and you came out that far ahead. There's something wrong with that. I don't think that guy was a good steward. And listen, if we do these three things if, as stewards, if we do all these things, you know, the master, they may, he may compensate us or allow us stewardship over more of what he possesses. And, but ultimately we've got to remember the things that we have belong to them. And as people, all right, especially as believers, we ought to understand that, that everything we have, it belongs to God. Everything you have, it belongs to God. We, you are stewards, whether you like it or not. In Job chapter 1, verse 21, he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job understood that, you know what, I lost everything I have, but in the end, Job said, it wasn't mine to begin with. It was God's. He gave it and he took it away. And I've used this illustration before that, you know, if you had a super nice car, I mean, you had, you know, one of these real fancy luxury cars and you said, listen, brother Tommy, I'm going away for a year. I would like for you to keep an eye on my car. You're allowed to use it whenever you want. Just take care of it. You know, keep gas in it, keep the oil change, park it in your garage it's yours to use while I'm gone, but eventually I'm going to ask for it back. And I just ask that you treat it like it was your own. Well, I would love that. I mean, I'm driving around a fancy car right now that I didn't pay for. You know, it's something that you allowed. And you know what? If you did that for me, I would be thrilled. And I wouldn't be mad at you if you came back six months later and said, you know what? I need it now. I'd just be thankful I had it for the six months. But what would, where it would be a problem is if during that time I got attached to it and after six months or a year, you came back. I'm like, no, this is mine. Possession is nine tenths of the law. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you know this, you know, I, I've had this all this time. This is mine now. 
But listen, that, that wouldn't be right. We should be thankful. And the problem is, when it comes to our possessions, somewhere along the lines, we forget that the things we have, they belong to God, and we think they're ours. And then all of a sudden, we get reminded of it. A preacher comes along and starts preaching on the tithe or something like that. We're like, whoa, 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 whoa. This is mine. You know, I'm supposed to give of what I have. I'm supposed to give of my possessions. I'm supposed to give of my time. Where did you get the idea that it was yours? Well, listen, you came into this world naked. You're going to you're, you're gonna leave. They might put some clothes on your corpse, but you know what? It's not going to do a whole lot of good. Listen, everything you have, it belongs to God, and you need to understand that you are a steward of it. And if he comes along and he asks you to give an account, hey, what have you done with what I've given you? You need to be ready to give an answer. And listen, whether the world likes it or not, Okay, I don't care if you you know you think, well, I don't like this. Uh, I'm going to quit going to church that way. I won't have to worry about it. Well, listen, even if you're lost, everything you have belongs to God. Colossians 1.16 says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. It's all his. So, well, I grew the tree. Well, you know what? He's the one that created the oxygen so the tree could grow. And you know what? That fruit on that tree is his. He lets us eat it. I'm glad he lets us eat the fruit of the ground. I'm glad he lets us eat the animals uh, that are out there in the world. I I have to eat an animal every day. I, 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 you know, every day an animal has to die. So I may live another day and you know and god has given us permission for that in the bible and you know don't look at me like an animal rights person y'all are going to eat some meat today too all right a bunch of us are going to go downstairs and we're going to probably eat a chicken or some other thing that was a living creature at one time and it died so we can stuff our faces and you know i'm thankful for that and though well they're all god's creatures yep and god said we can eat them and so we're not violating any commands god gave us permission to eat his creatures and i am thankful for that i like fruit and vegetables but you got to have meat with it too it's just it i don't know that's just that's my opinion but it's all his and even in the world everything it was it was created for him by him and the main requirement the main qualification of a steward is faithfulness first corinthians 4 2 says moreover it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful are you someone that god can trust as a church, are we someone that God, that God can trust? You know, in the last six years, God has, God's blessed our church. And there's no doubt that God has come through on his end and everything. But, you know, what about us? Have we been good stewards with what God has given us? And listen, a church, folks, listen, a church is not a building. A church, it's the people in the church. All right. It's the people. They are the church. And listen, and I, I know that I personally want to God see you. I want to see God use our church. I, I know I want that. I think you all do too. But you understand, in order for God to entrust us with more, we have to prove ourselves faithful with what he's given us. We have to prove that. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So how do we, as members of this church, give an account of our stewardship? Okay, I want us to give an account of our stewardship today. Let's give an account, okay? Just like if you went to the bank and said, listen, I want to know how much money I have in the bank, okay? You ought to be keeping track of it too, but sometimes we lose track of things and you expect them to know. You expect them to have uh, records of the checks that, you know, that were cashed there and of, you know, debit card transactions. You expect that from them. I went to a bank, one, my, our bank one time, not long after we got married, and there was $500 missing from my savings account. And I'm like, what happened? And I asked them, give an account because it's not showing on my records. And they went and looked and somehow they accidentally transferred some of my money into somebody else's account. I don't know how they did that, but you know what? I'm glad they at least had a record and figured it out and they changed it and gave me my money back. Now it was weird when that happened. That same, I, and while that was annoying, that same bank one time, a check that I wrote for like $180 got cash. People got their money. And it never came out of my account. Never. It never happened. I, I, I didn't have a problem with that. But that bank, they, they weren't very good stewards. Thankfully, it, it actually worked to my advantage. 
at one point. But listen, uh, we, need, we, need, we need to give an account of our stewardship. What does God expect from us? With, and so the first thing I, I just want to ask is, you know, how faithful have you been and your church attendance? Hey, listen, if God is going to use our church, if we're going to accomplish anything, we need faithful people in this church. We need people who are going to show up. A church, it is a people, it's a called out assembly. But listen, if people aren't assembling, if they're not faithful in the assembling, we're not going to be able to accomplish as much. It's, it's going to hurt us as a church. Okay, if our Liberty Baptist Church will fail, if the people of Liberty Baptist Church all sit at home every Sunday and every Wednesday, we're supposed to assemble together. That's what a church is. And we don't believe in a universal church that everyone who is saved is a part of. No, a church, it's an assembly. And if you are a part of this church, you know, if you're able, uh, sometimes people physically can't, but if you're physically able to, you ought to be here. And I'm preaching this, and I'm going to be gone next week. But you know, you're allowed to take a vacation every now and then. But you need to be here. And Acts chapter 2, verse 1, look, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, this is when God was getting ready to really use the church. This is where he's getting ready to pour his spirit on them. And when that day was come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them, eat cloven tongues like as fire, and they sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When God started to use that church, it was when they were all assembled. They were all with all accord and in one place. And listen, we are a people as a church. It's the people. But you know what? We sometimes we need to come together on a regular basis. You're not going to get as much, you know, getting preaching, watching it on YouTube. All right. It's better for you to hear my preaching here, live in person. It's better for you. It's better for everyone else. All right? I mean, if we're just going to, you know, just lay at home and not make the assembly important, well, you know what? Why don't I just preach sermons to my camera, you know, in my house and just let you all watch them and we can save money on, you know, the mortgage. We can just sell the building, not have all these things. And I'll just, I'll just do, be like one of these YouTube preachers that, that actually do that. And you know what? Some of these guys make a lot of money. Some of these guys, they don't have churches, they don't have buildings, they make videos in their house preaching to people, and they've got a bunch of lazy Christians that are out there that are too pathetic and lazy to go to church, and they watch these people, and they send them money. And they don't even have a real church. Maybe I should just do that. You know, you don't have to deal with any of the drama. If you all start, you know, getting annoying and leaving nasty comments, I'll just block you. And they don't have to listen. You can do that on YouTube. You know, but listen, folks, you're not helping anybody with that. You know who you'd be helping? You'd be helping me. But you're not helping anybody else. You're not even helping yourself. And I'm telling you, that, you know, that, that's, that's a fraud. That's phony. That's not the real thing. Listen, you are not going to church just because you watch a service on TV, on YouTube. That is not the same thing. Church, it's an assembly of people. And you know what? We need people to be faithful. How would you like it if just occasionally I just didn't show up without telling anybody? You know, we all, you know everybody gets mad if a preacher makes a big deal about himself. And I don't, I don't think I do that. If the pastor gets up and acts like he's the king of the church and he's the most important thing in the church, oh no, we're all equal, all equal. Well, yeah, I agree with you. Well, if you can just lay out whenever you want, I can lay out whenever I want. And I can just, you can often figure it out. How, how does that sound? You know, that sound fair? You, know, you, you wouldn't like that. You all expect me to be faithful. And you know what? I expect you to be faithful too. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And God expects us to be faithful because folks, I am not the church. We are the church. And a church, it's not just a group. It's not just saved people all over. It's an assembly of people. And they, and they need to come together. And they need to be of one accord. And they need to be in one place. And it's important, folks. It's not just important to me, and it is important to me. I'll admit it. It's important to me, but it's important to God, too. God cares about that. God is the one who set that up. God is the one who started this thing. And it was God. He moved with them on Pentecost when they were all one accord in one place. That is what a church is. And if you are not a part of an assembly of people, you are not a part of a church. And, 
You need to be faithful in your attendance. God expects you to have your carcass in church. That body that you have, God expects it to be in church. God expects that from you. Oh, I don't have time. Well, guess who? You know, it was God that created the 24 hours in a day that we have. It was God that created time. Okay? I preached about that last Sunday night. We've all got the same amount of time in the day. We all have 24 hours. We all have the same number of hours in the week. Listen, God expects you with the time that he has given you, God expects you to go to church. God expects you in the house of God and he expects you to be faithful to it. And so, you know, how have you been doing on that? You know, give an account. What have, what have you been doing with your time in that area? When, you know, when you don't have time for church, so I'm not, I'm not talking about when you're sick and things are going on. But listen, when you just didn't have time, what was it that took the place of that? You know, I hope the Lord like that TV, you know, really appreciates that TV show that you watched instead of going to church, whatever it was. You know, you got these people, I, you know, I believe it's the Lord this time, you know, you know, those, I, I believe it's the Lord's day, you know, it belongs to God, but you know, sometimes we have to work. Okay. Well, if you really, really believe that it's the Lord's day and it's for serving the Lord, but you just had to work and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, since, you know, God didn't provide a way for you to not have to work on Sunday. How about all that money that you made on the Lord's day? You give to the Lord. I, you know, that might get me off preaching against working on Sunday. I don't know. It, it, it wouldn't do that, but it would tempt me. It would tempt me for sure. But listen, you know, we, you know, we, we're not, we're not being honest folks. And listen, it's, you, it's okay for you to expect me to be faithful. You ought to, but I expect you to be faithful too. And God wants us to be faithful. And we can all talk about our time constraints and everything, but understand it's God that gave us the time that we have and God is not going to ask us to do something we're not capable of doing. And God wants us to be an assembly. And so then Philippians 4.15, and if that you know, didn't go over great, you know, let's try this one here. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. This will probably go over even worse. But, you know, I, I, I told you all you can handle the meat, all right? So don't, don't go making me look bad and uh, prove me wrong. Don't start choking after I buttered you up, after I said all those good things about you. Don't start choking, all right? This is, this is just Bible right here. Philippians 4.15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again into my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all in abound, I am full and have reward, even Epaphroditus, the things which were sent um, from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How faithful have you been in your giving? The Apostle Paul, he commends the Philippian church there because... In the beginning, when he talks about the communicating, it's concerning giving. All right, there he was trying to get money so he could help these poor saints that were in Jerusalem. And you know what? No church was helping them with that except for them. And he commended them for their faithfulness and their giving. It was a blessing to them. It was an encouragement to them. It was a sacrifice. It was a sweet smell to God. And it, it did. It, it motivated Paul because of the faithfulness and their giving. It, it helped them out. Great things were able to be done because these people participated. And listen, I want God to do great things with his church. But listen, folks, things cost money. All right. You know, we like these buildings. We like having air conditioning. You know, we could keep it just warm enough that the pipes don't freeze in here all winter. But I'd like to see how much you enjoy that church service. But you know what? We, we like having some of those things. But you know what? NICOR gas, they don't care that we're a church and that we shouldn't have to pay them. You know, they don't care that we, you know, they, they, I think they ought to give us our gas for free just because we're a church. That's what I think. They just, they disagree with me. I think the city of Rock Falls, we pay the electric company to, I think they ought to give us a big discount. You ought to see all the taxes and fees that are on our bill. I think we should be exempt from those things, but they disagree. And they're the ones that provide for those things. And they expect us to pay for those things. And they're not cheap, folks. And listen, God's given us this building. We, we, ought, we need to take care of it. We need to maintain it. We need to fix things. But you know what? Stuff costs money. And giving is just, it's, it's necessary. You all, as, as a pastor, I'm one of the biggest expenses. 
All right? You all expect me to labor in the Word of God. That takes a lot of time. You expect me to minister to the saints, you know, and visit people and, and to do all the things that a pastor does. But you know what? I've got six kids and they all want to eat every day. And I've, I've got to live in a house. I'm not going to make my family live in a tent. You all aren't living in tents. So why should we live in tents? You all drive cars. Why should I have to walk everywhere? And why should my family have to walk everywhere? It's okay for me to expect the things that you have. You know, if I'm ministering to you in spiritual things, then I, I, mean, I should be able to reap your carnal things. But folks, you have to be faithful in the giving. And you know, you can't take vacations from that stuff. I think that happens sometimes around here, all right? I think we just, you know, I don't know, we'll, we'll get caught up later. Well, you know, unfortunately, I don't get to explain that to the people we pay bills to. They don't care. They expect things when, when it's due. And thank the Lord that, you know, he's provided. We've not been laid on bills and things like that. But let me tell you, my faith's been tested a few times, all right? You know, uh, there's been some extra stress that has come my way a few times. You know, there's some things that we've done without a few times. I'm telling you, man, I, I want to have our door smashing celebration. All right, we're getting close. All right, we're getting close. But folks, you know how faithful you've been getting? That money that you have, it's not yours. You know, God wants you to do something with it. God wants you to accomplish something for the work of the Lord with what He has given you. He is, it belongs to Him. You are a steward of it. Are you using any of it for His glory? Are you using any of it? And if you are, how, you know, how much of it? You don't have to tell me. I'm not telling you to give an account to me, but I'm telling you to give an account to God today. How much of, you know, what percentage of your money goes towards entertainment, towards staring at screens, towards your cable, towards your internet, and all your cell phones, and all these luxury items that we just waste time on to the point we can't even read our Bibles? How much time is spent on that? How much money is spent on that? How much could we accomplish for the work of the Lord with half of that money that you spend on those things? Listen, I'm not crazy enough to tell you to get rid of all that stuff. You'd tar and feather me, all right? But at the same time, you know, talk to God about that. Lord, you've given me this. You know, how much can I spend? You know, do that. Pray that sometime. You're just, I'll but most of you be scared to pray that. Lord, how much of my money am I allowed to spend on luxury and pleasure? You know, just ask him that. You know, I don't care what you do with it. A ask him and see what he tells you. You know, go ahead and do a budget. See what percentage is going towards those things versus how much is going towards the work of the Lord. And ask God, Lord, are you okay with that? Are you okay with these numbers right here? I don't think most of us are going to want to pray that because I think we already know what the answer would be. But folks, you're a steward. You need to be ready to give an account. I think we ought to do those things. I think it's very important. And so, you know, how faithful have you been in your church attendance? How faithful have you been in your giving? All right, and then look, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. I'm spending a long time on these things. I need to get moving. And some of you are thinking, yeah, you need to get moving. All right, get, get off those ones real quick. Get up. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. And it says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof, with you know ye not that they which run in a race run all but one receiveth the prize so run that ye may obtain and every man that striveth for the mastery is temper in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible paul was talking about how you know i i'm, I'm being all things to all men it wasn't that he was being phony but paul was saying you know he would put himself in uncomfortable situations you know he would do whatever he had to do to bring people to christ whatever it was that he had to do he would do it because he wanted to bring people to Christ. And he mentions there, he's like, I'm doing these things, these things I do, these things I participate in that I might not necessarily care for, that might not necessarily be my thing. I'm doing these things for the gospel's sake. They help advance the gospel. And he's like, I want to be a partaker with you. 
And I want to ask you, how faithful have you been in your participation in what goes on here at the church? That's another thing that's important is being involved in the things that go on. Listen, church, it's not just about, you know, me getting up here and entertaining you for an hour, you know, and tickling your ears and singing a song that brings you pleasure. Folks, we've been called as believers to spread the gospel to all the world. That's all. That's our job. Are you, are you participating in that? Are you getting involved in that in any way? A lot of the things we do, the activities, maybe an extra service, whatever it is, we do these things, you know, to exhort the brethren. All right. Last Monday, you know, we, we had the picnic out at our house. Okay. That's, those are those, that's for fun. That's to exhort one another, to encourage one another. Sometimes the things we do, it's not even so much about necessarily accomplishing something, but about exhorting one another, encouraging one another, just being a blessing, fellowshipping. Are you getting involved in those things? Are you participating? And the things that go on in this church, it's a, it's a blessing when you do that. These things help advance the gospel. We live in a wicked world. We need to keep each other encouraged and motivated and participation in what goes on in this church, no matter how small. Listen, even you know, from the little things to the big things, just being involved and saying, you know what, I want to be a part, I want to participate in that. I want to get involved in that. Whatever it is the church is trying to do, whatever they're trying to accomplish, whatever the event is, I want to be a part of it. I want to see it succeed because I, I just want to help that church advance the gospel. Whatever it is, I want to participate somehow. Hey, what can I do? How can I help? How can I take part? What can I do to make it better? How can I participate in the service? How can I make you know, church services a little bit better for everyone else? You know, and there's, listen, don't make me tell you everything, you know, maybe you're helping in the specials, singing a special, singing out in the congregational singing, you know, playing instruments, whatever. I mean, just serving, whatever it is, just participate, just help say, all right, I'm in. Why? Because I, I'm a part of a church. I'm a part of an assembly. I'm a partaker. We are a team and I'm going to participate. I don't want to just sit on the bench. I don't want to just sit on the sidelines, whatever's going on, even if it's not necessarily my thing, I'm in, I'm involved. I want to be a part of it. Why? Because I want to help this church. And listen, if we're not faithful in those things, you know, and, and you do, you have people, oh, you know, we should do this activity as a church. Well, you know, when I can get people showing up for this and this, maybe we'll do some of those things. Why well, can get you showing up for anything. You know, I'll get, I'll, maybe we'll do some of those things. You know, we all have our things that we like and we all have our things that we don't care for. But listen, when it comes to us being a church, it's not just about what I like and what I want. Listen, I'm a part, I'm a part of this team. And so if there's something that's going on, I mean, whether it be a baby shower for one of the ladies, all right? And, you know, as a guy, I can't really do anything, but you know what? I could help set up the tables and chairs beforehand. I could help eat the leftovers. You know, I can, I can, I can maybe watch some of the kids. You know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get in on it. I'm going to participate somehow. I want to be a part of it. Why? Because, hey, this is, this is an event that's going on in my church, and I want it to be successful. Whatever it is. And, we, and you need, every one of us ought to have that attitude. that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be involved. I'm going to take part in it. And so, because it, it encourages people. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. One of the reasons that we assemble together, it's so we can exhort one another. And how have you been in your exhortation? Who are you encouraging? Who do you encourage when you sit at home and you just watch the services online instead of being a part of the service? Who are you encouraging by that? Who are you encouraging when you're not there, when people sing the songs and you're not out there for them to watch it? Who are you encouraging by that? Nobody. And folks, listen, you know, I mean, it, you have no idea how the little things can help. You know, some of you being here today, you can encourage one of the ladies who worked hard making some food by helping make sure it all gets eaten. Okay, you know, no lady wants to make something and nobody eats it. All right, you know, that I mean, if that happens, guess what? They're not making anything next time. And pretty, if everybody starts doing that, our fellowships are going to be really lame because there's not going to be any food. 
Well, listen, we had people that cooked and made some food. And, our, and one of, you know, some of us, it's our job to participate. Make sure it gets eight. All right? And you don't get involved in that. You know what? Stay and do some eating. <laughs> Stay in fellowship. Help encourage these ladies. All right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and encourage them. I'm going to eat some food. And you say, that's no big deal. I, I, I'd rather go home and lay on the couch, watch TV. I'd rather go get McDonald's drive through No, encourage these ladies that made the food and go eat it. All right? They did some work. Participate. Encourage them. Stop thinking about yourself. That's the problem with many people that come to church today. It's all about me. What's in it for me? No, you come to church so you can exhort one another. That's why you're not supposed to forsake the assembling. People need your encouragement. And you being here today and eating somebody's food might be the one thing that you know, doesn't offend them. You know, they don't, they're not going to get offended and leave the church because nobody liked their cheese casserole or something. You know, cause, and you know, if, if somebody made that, you know, I hope somebody's out here that will participate in that because it's not going to be me. But you know, it, it, it'll help. I, 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 listen, I don't want anybody to get offended and not come because their food didn't get ate. But listen, I'm not eating that. All right? even, even if it means you're not coming back to church, you know, there's just some things I won't do. But some of you might be willing to do that. You might be more of an exhorter than I am. And so do it. Participate. And then just real quickly, this last thing. You know, how faithful have you been in your spirit? Fine, I'll do these things. And there are some people that do that. They'll come to church, fine. Yeah. Look, pastor, I'm here. I'm here. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Here, here. I'm putting my money in the offering. I'm probably going to starve to death this week. I'll do all these things. Yeah, I'll participate. I'll go stuff that food down my throat. I'll probably have to go throw up in the bathroom later, but I'll do it because you're telling me I need to participate in these things. I need to encourage one another. But listen, it said, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. You know what? How have you been with your spirit? God wants you to rule over your spirit, not someone else. We got a lot of people, they've got a bad attitude when they come into the church, and they blame everybody else for their bad attitude. If you have a bad attitude, it's your fault. It's your problem, not everybody else. And you need to rule over your spirit. And when you participate, when you do all these things, when you come to church, when you give, when you're exhorting one another, when you're participating, if you do it with a bad spirit, it's not going to help. And listen, I've been in churches where the people in the church are faithful and they attend church, but they come with a bad spirit all the time. And, no, and if you do that, nobody's going to get encouraged by that. You need to make sure you've got control over your spirit. That is your job to rule over your spirit. You need to do that and make sure you do these things with a good attitude. And I do, folks. I want, I want you here in church. But listen, please... You know, don't drag your carcass in here acting like a victim and making me feel bad because I guilted you into coming to church. You know, no, you do it with a good attitude and with a good spirit. Don't act like your kids when you tell them to clean their room and they're cleaning their room and they're complaining and mumbling the whole time. Listen, if you're going to have that attitude, you know what? I'd rather you forsake the assembling. You know, and, and a lot of people in churches, they're, they do the things that are expected of them but they've got such a bad attitude and it just kills the spirit of the whole church. And folks, you need to be faithful in that. You need to have a good attitude. You need to have a good spirit. And you need to, well, I, you know, I can't help it. This person just gets my goat. Well, you know what? You let them take your city. You let them defeat you. You're not mighty, according to Proverbs 16, verse 32. And you just need to admit it. I'm a wimp. I let some tongue of a woman destroy my spirit. Just because I couldn't handle her words. I let her ruin my attitude. I let her put me in disobedience to God. Just because of words that she said. Like she's magic or something. It can say magic words and just change you. And you know, we give people that power over us sometimes. So we'll let someone's words change our attitude and get us in direct disobedience to God. Folks, you need to rule over your spirit. We need to be faithful and have a faithful spirit. And keep a right attitude. And then finally, you need to be how faithful have you been in your walk with God? Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, 
and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You know what? As a church, it's important that, listen, nobody does these things in church. Nobody does these things in the assembly. But folks, if God is going to bless our church, you need to be walking with God all week. Listen, I don't, it doesn't matter if we've got the best looking, the best talking, the best dressed people in here on Sundays. If you're just like the rest of the world the rest of the week, why would God bless our church? God's not going to bless us because we put on a good show on Sunday. God's going to bless us when we're living like his people every day of the week. And, God, and you need to understand if God is going to bless our church and going to increase our church, folks, we have got to make sure we are walking with Him every day, not just here on Sundays and on Wednesday nights. Every day you need to be walking with God. Every day you need to be fellowshipping with God. Every day you need to be in your Bible and praying and calling on the Lord. Every day you've got to be doing those things. And if you, if you don't, God's not going to bless our church. God does, God's not going to care how good our doctrinal statement is if we're not living that doctrinal statement during the week. God's not going to care how good the preaching is in this church if no one's listening to the preaching, including the pastor. We've got to actually practice what is preached in this church if God is going to bless it. You do. As the part of the assembly, you are the church. I am not the church. You are just as much of this church as I am. All of you are more of this church than this building is. And if Liberty Baptist Church is all over this area living like the world, God is not going to bless this church. And you better, better get these things right, folks. Because you know what? I do. I want God to bless this church. And if we've got leaven, you know what? God's commanded us to purge out the leaven. And you know what? I, I hate to throw anybody out. I'm not threatening anybody right now. I don't, I don't know of anything worth throwing anybody out. I don't, I don't want to do anything like that. But you know, listen, it's our job to do that. And if we have to, that's what we're going to do because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If we let sin in this church, it's just going to spread. It's just going to get worse. And listen, that's those sins that it talks about, it's not talking about those sins taking place in the assembly. It's talking about being done amongst people in the assembly at any time. We've got to watch these things. You better have a walk with God. You as a member of this church, if you don't have a walk with God, you are hurting this church. And we, we don't want you to do that. We want you to help. And you will help by having a close walk with God. Every time you read your Bible, every time you pray, you help this church. Every time you're out there and you have a good testimony and you follow the commands of God, you are helping this church. And you know, many, and we, and listen, I do, I want God to bless. I want this church to grow. But you know, many people are looking for a church where they can serve, but they often don't want to serve in smaller churches. Because a lot of people are just looking for the limelight. You know, they want that big church that has a lot to offer. They want to have the big audience. But you know what? All of us should be faithful to our church, no matter what the size of the church is. Whether it be 10 or 100 or 1,000, all of us ought to be faithful. And listen, if you want to be faithful in a small church, you're not going to be faithful in a big church. And if us as a smaller church, if we're not faithful as a small church, God will never make us a big church. That's very clear from that parable in Luke chapter 16. And so you know what? Are you a faithful steward? I encourage you to check yourself on these things. Give an account. Do an inventory in your life and say, all right, how am I helping? What am I doing to help this church? I love Liberty Baptist Church. I want to help. You've got to do these things. It is so important that you do, that you do them. Are you a faithful steward? And so with that, let's all stand together.